Second Corinthians chapter number six. <clears throat> Again, reading of verse number 14. The Bible says, be, not ye, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? <clears throat> and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, last week we was in chapter number 5, dealing with the idea that although we are in the flesh we desire to be with God in spirit for we know when we'll be with him we'll be like him we'll finally be the completed and perfect work that God envisioned us becoming when he saved us that's what he's seen us as ever since the day we got saved and that's what he desires us to be we strive to get as close to that as we can down here on earth but one day all things will be as they should be we'll be with the Lord forevermore but verse 6 talks about while we're waiting on that to happen we get into chapter number 6 how we ought to conduct ourselves in this earthly tabernacle that the Lord has indwelled verse number 14 most of the time people like to read this verse and it's oft quoted referencing marriage which is true be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers when it comes to marriage. But I don't find the word marriage in verse number 14. It's not just referring to when people get married. It's talking about all aspects and all walks of your life. Yoke just means to be joined. To be pulling together. Right? Oxen don't have to be married in order to get into the same yoke on the, out on the farm. Right when it says yoke together, it means that you join yourself to something. Does not Jesus entreat those that don't know him to take his their yoke or his yoke upon them, because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He's saying, Come and join what's he saying? Accept salvation. Hook up with me. And he says, My yoke's easy. The world's yoke is hard. His burden is light. Your burdens, even the, own, the burdens that you put upon yourself, if you're not careful, those will cripple you. But Christ's burden is simply to live for him. They say, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. But, he said, I'll take all those burdens. The burden that I give you is light in comparison. He broke all of our chains. He broke all of the boundaries that kept us from getting to God. He bears the weight of our sin, past, present, and future, upon him still to this day. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? We got it easy. But in this verse, he says, Be ye not equally, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And unequal yoking is where one person's either doing all the work. Well, that's what we got with Christ. He takes a lot of the burden, and we have to do very little. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about a workload. It's talking about who you're yoked up with. Okay, farmers were taking old seasoned oxen, or ox, and then put it with a new calf, or one that's within the first couple of years that may have not pulled a yoke before. And they don't expect the young oxen to really pull all that much weight. Because of that, they're not making real deep plow rounds right they're just scraping the top layers just trying to get that young oxen used to pulling the yoke they know that it's not strong enough yet they know that if the older oxen were to stop pulling the young one couldn't keep everything in motion but they're getting that young oxen used to the yoke 
used to what it feels like to have weight upon your shoulders. That, that's us with the Lord. You say, well, how is that not unequally yoked together? Because they're both oxen. You don't put an ox and then a mule next to each other. They're not going to work. Mules are known for being stubborn. Oxen are known for being hard workers. That mule tries to pull in one direction and the ox tries to pull in the other direction. They're going to be fighting each other. Nothing's going to get done. The plow's not going to move at all. But one's doing all the work and the young one's not doing anything. Well, the young one's learning. For a time, the old one will carry all of this burden so that in time, the young one will be able to bear his own burden. What do you call that? That's called training. That's called edifying. That's called showing somebody, handing it down to the next generation. Right? Y'all, at one point or another, I guarantee you bought one of your kids one of them goofy little plastic steering wheels for the car seat. Were you really going to let them drive? No, but you was get them, getting them used to the idea that one day they could drive. Right? Did you say, all right, it's all yours, and then just let go of your steering wheel? No. Right? Even driving instructors are smart enough that when they've got student drivers in the car, they've got a brake pedal on their side of the car. And it works better than the one on the, the driver's side. How do you know? Because when they hit that sucker, the car will do a headstand. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Even when you give somebody a little bit of weight, you don't let them go out there on your own. That's why they're yoked in pairs. That's why Christ said, don't ever leave you nor forsake you. Because he knows you're always going to need somebody there on the other side of the yoke. Somebody there to help you pull. So, Brother Jordan, if that's not what it's talking about when it's talking about unequally yoked together, what it saying? it's saying don't put an ox and don't put a dog in the same yoke. Ain't going to work. Right? Don't even put an oxen and another beast of burden. Take whatever you want. Right? Certain animals like being around their own kind. Occasionally you'll get something weird, like a dog that'll be happy running around a pack of sheep all day. But really, it don't want to be with the sheep. It likes running around because it knows if it keeps the sheep safe, the person that feeds it is going to be happy. It's called the shepherd. They know they got a job to do. That's why the Bible says when you know, he set up his earthly kingdom, when the wolf will lay down with the lamb, what's it talking about? When he comes, peace is going to happen. True peace. Why? Because he is the prince of peace. But until that happens, things that aren't like each other are very, very unlikely to get along with each other. But he's saying, as a Christian, you ought to strive. It ought to be your goal, that not just in marriage, but in all walks of your life, not to become unequally yoked with unbelievers. Who are unbelievers? Well, unbelievers could mean lost folk. Later on, it talks about infidels. What are those? Those are people that believe or deny what we believe and replace it with something else. There's heathens and people that don't know what to believe. They just believe whatever okay there are barbarians right the bible talks about who are those those are the uncivilized back in the day they were ones that didn't have culture didn't have what according to outsiders they didn't have anything going on that was good but unbelievers cannot just be those that don't know the lord unbelievers can be people that believe a different way what are you talking about, Jordan? Why? Find a man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Not some words, every word. So if you've got somebody that doesn't believe that the Bible that you read is the word of God, you ain't going to get along with them. But we agree on most things. Doesn't mean that you agree on everything. You've unequally yoked yourself together. You're saying we can only talk about these three things when we're around each other, or else there's going to be conflict. That's how being equally yoked. Equally yoked means no matter what comes down the road, y'all going to pull together and get through it or get over it. 
You're going to put it behind you because you have a common goal. Well, Brother Jordan, what are you saying? I'm saying that some friends become a hindrance if you bring up certain topics. And some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. You can think of one of your friends and say, well, I know I'm not supposed to talk about this around them. Some of that's common decency, because right? you don't want to offend people. But at a certain point, it goes past, well, I don't want to make that person feel uncomfortable. That person has convictions that are so opposed to yours that you can't be friends with them and still pull the direction that the Lord wants you to pull. Or you've got to stop pulling the direction that the Lord wants you to pull when you're around them because they want to pull a different direction. I find that we're always to be about the Father's business. I find that we're supposed to pull that we're supposed to finish our course. But I've never run one, obviously. But they tell me that marathons, that there aren't pit stops, but there are water tables. There are points where you can become refreshed, but there's never a time between start and finish that if you want to win and finish first, you can't just stop running. You can't just stop and say, well, hang on, time out, make everybody else stop. I got to tie my shoe. There have been recorded events where people have finished races with one shoe because they didn't want to stop and get the other one, put it back on. But he's saying they were committed to finishing. They were going to pull against that yoke until they met the finish line. Well, if you're always stopping, if you're always taking the yoke off, if you're always having to make compromises so that there's no friction between you and somebody else, guess who you left in your yoke? The Lord. He's never taken his yoke off. But you've got to take his yoke off in order to be unequally yoked together with somebody else. Because in truth, if they're yoked up with the Lord and you're yoked up with the Lord, you're both pulling in the same direction. It's not the two of you that yokes you together. It's the Lord that yokes you together. Well, not just for instance. I mean, we can talk about business partners. We can talk... Anybody in your life, I believe it's the perfect will of God that if you realize that what they want you to do would cause you to pull in a different direction than what God wants you to pull, I believe God don't want you to hook up with them, link up with them, join up with them, commit yourself to them. Because yoking does mean that there's some sort of an agreement. There's a contract. That there is a choice that you two make to continue on together. Well, verse number 15. What concord? Concord, not just a bird. Okay, but concord means fellowship. Concord means comes from the same root word as concourse, meaning business. Okay, when you go to a airport and they say go down to the concourse what's that that's where everybody's passing through to get to where they're headed the concourse isn't the destination but it'll get you to the place that you need to go so it says in what concord hath Christ with Belial in other words right in what universe are Christ and Satan going to be pulling in the same direction never At what point do you think that you can live a holy, righteous, perfect, will of God kind of Christian life, but still be able to take that yoke off and then go put a different yoke on? Not going to happen. You know who gets to decide what yoke is put on the oxen? The master, the farmer, the one that owns the property. doesn't say in this verse, don't let God unequally yoke you with someone. God will never do that. Be ye not unequally yoked together. Don't put yourself in an unequal yoke. But it says, and what part has that belief, he that believeth with an infidel? If you are a new creature, blood-bought, born-again. We'll make 
some people are angry you don't necessarily have to be baptized unless you want to be a member of a church then yeah you got to be baptized into the church but if you're a new creature don't take baptism to become a new creature it just takes a new birth but if you're that new creature and deep down in your soul there is a desire not only to please the Father a desire to have fellowship with the Father a desire to be conformed to the image of the Father's Son, and a desire to accomplish the will of God for your life, you cannot have those desires, those goals, and those that driving force in your life and still be hooked up with infidel. You see, here's the difference between, well, one of the many differences, but the biggest difference between how Christianity, true Christianity, not what the world calls Christianity, but true followers of Christ and followers of Muhammad, there's a difference on how they deal with infidels. Muhammad wants to kill them all so he doesn't have to deal with them no more. Christ says, don't join up with them. Don't unequally yoke yourself together with them. But it doesn't say anything about wiping them off the face of the earth. Why? Because it's the Lord's will that they not be infidels anymore. That they be converted into believers. But he says, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Meaning, if y'all can't agree on the basic core principles of life. Okay, now... You may use the same book that I use. You may have personal convictions. That's fine. That's your personal conviction. But if you and me disagree on doctrine, chances are we're not going to be able to walk with each other. Not for any extended period of time. Why? Because something's going to come along that's going to divide us. You say, well, Brother Jordan, that, that won't happen. You just, both people just need to be more understanding. I want you to go back and I want you to look at Paul and Barnabas. Those fellas traveled half of the known world at least, side by side laboring in the Lord until something caused a rift. Paul didn't leave Barnabas. Barnabas decided he was going to stay and not continue on with Paul. Go study out your Bible. You know what it was? It was doctrine. Some believe that you had to be circumcised in order to truly be saved if you was a Gentile. Paul said it was all a bunch of hogwash. God said it was all a bunch of hogwash. Because you don't add the law unto faith because that kills faith. If faith was enough, if that's what Jesus said to save you, for by grace are you saved through faith. If faith was the only metric that God wanted, you can't add to it. But that caused the division between Paul and Barnabas. Then what do you find? You find that Paul, next time he goes out, he's traveling with Silas. Because they could not agree, they could not continue on. I'm sure that 99.999% of stuff they might have agreed on. Because they traveled a long time with each other before that came up. But when it did, the yoke got broke. It shattered the relationship between both of them. But you say, Brother I don't care how much you like somebody, you want to be friendly with somebody. Eventually, there's going to come a point where if y'all want to continue on, you either have to compromise what the book says or they're going to have to get right with God. But see, yoked has an implied connotation to it. The oxen cannot put itself into the yoke, and the oxen cannot take itself out of the yoke. Sometimes you make your bed, and you got to sleep in it. Some days you get your cake, and you have to eat it too. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? There's been a time that I've had to eat crow. Why? Because the Lord did it? No, because I did it, and then I had to deal with it.
it says. And what communion hath light with dark. Communion means that you meet each other on equal ground. Communion means that you set everything else aside and all you're concerned about is fellowshipping with that person. That's the kind of relationship that God desires with the saints. But we love that illustration of supping from the saucer. Right? Face to face with God, drinking from the same vessel. That's what communion entails. But how can you do that when you can't even agree what is good or what is not good to consume? I'm not sitting down and having dinner with a vegan. If I am, it ain't going to be eating the same plate that they're eating. Because even the stuff, if I don't eat meat, right, the stuff that I think tastes good, everything tastes better with butter on it. Nope, can't do that if you're a vegan. Why? Because butter comes from cow. Not well, fine. Worst case scenario, scrambled eggs always good. Nope, can't do that. That comes from chicken. What do you want me to eat? I want you to drink this nut milk, right? Cashews, almonds, whatever. Pick whatever kind of nut you want. We make milk out of it. How? Right? I've eaten lots of nuts. I've never gotten juice out of one of them. Well, you say, well, if you can't agree on basic things, how do you think you're going to yoke up together and get past complicated things in life? You can't commune if you're not on equal footing. Why do you think the Bible says how sweet it is when the brethren dwell in unity? Why? Because then communion can happen with each other and with Christ. It says, verse number 16, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? If I ever did this, I guarantee our pastor would shoot me. If he didn't, Christian would. Right? But if I were to come in here today with one of those giant crucifixes that Catholics have, depicting a Christ on the cross, you know what that is? That's idolatry. It's not what the Lord looked like. But how do you know that? Because one, you can recognize it as a human. The Bible says that his vision was marred much more than a man. But two, the law still does impact the doubt shout, not have any graven of anything in the earth, above the earth, under the earth. But see, just as there's no place in the house of God for false idols, why do you think that in your life, being the temple of the Holy Ghost after you get saved why do you think that there's any place in your life for people to come in and bring things into your life that have nothing to do with God you know what it'll do it'll grieve you at a minimum you know worst case scenario what it'll do it'll cause you to defile yourself and one thing that used to be the house of God will be turned over to a house of devils that's what all the conquerors did in their days. What they do, they'd come in, they'd destroy the house of God, and they'd take the things of God and go put them in one of the temples to one of their deities. They tried to do that with the ark one time, and God just kept knocking over all their statues of their God until finally it broke. Trying to do what? Prove a point that there's only one God. Well, Dagon was his name. He also showed all the Egyptians how all of their gods had no power. Why? Because every one of those plagues that he sent to Egypt disproved one of their major deities. All throughout the Bible, God's been showing, proven, giving example after example that there is only one God who hears. There's only one God that speaks. Who's that? That's Jehovah, the God that lives. The Holy One. Well, if you know that, In order to have some people in your life, you're going to have to take those things that you know and you're going to have to hide them. You're going to have to store them away. Why? So that they can come in and have room to put things that they want to talk about in your life. But agreement has the temple of God with idols. doesn't say that you can't put them in there. It says what agreement. I dare say that so many Christians that once used to sit in these very pews. But nowadays you can't even find them going to darken the doors of a church. 
Why did that happen? It didn't happen because of God. Because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It didn't happen because there's salvation more off. Once saved, always saved. If they really got under the blood, you're going to see them in glory one day. I believe that. But some people that used to that aren't anymore, why'd that happen? Because they allowed things into their life that didn't agree with Christ. And instead of trying to usher those things out of their life, they yoked up with them. They didn't just entertain the idea. They took it and they made it, affixed it to their life. And it didn't agree with Christ. But I find that a man cannot serve two masters. He'll love one and hate the other. I don't care how many books, you know, study material you got on the books of the Bible on a shelf. I don't care about how many preaching tapes or preaching CDs or playlists you got on YouTube of things that, you know, purportedly are for the edification and the furtherance of God's work. I don't care how much of it you've got stashed around. Somebody walk in and may think, wow, they sh they've got a lot of books written about, you know, studies on the Bible or characters in the Bible or in-depth analysis and comparison between different gene you know genealogies or different time frames in the Bible. I don't care how much you got on the wall. I care how much of it made it into your heart. Why do I care about that? Because that's what Jesus cares about. Man look at on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. You can have all of the fixings and decorations in your life of wow this person surely knows a lot about the Lord. But all of those things are on the shelf. That means they're not being used. God cares about what you've given over those places of honor in your life. The seat of authority in your heart. Who sits on that? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you think about? What's the last thing you think about? When you go to work, right, what vision do you have? What goal do you have in your head? Are you going to work because you want to be used of the Lord that day? Are you going to work because you're trying to save up to go and buy something else? Well, you say, I'm saying we're supposed to be temples of the Holy Ghost, but yet some, some, of, some reason that people used to be here aren't here no more. You know why? They took places where Jesus should have been in control of their life and they gave something else, put something else in its place. They put an idol there. Then what happened? God said, if you don't want me, fine. Doesn't matter that they've still got all the stuff that they studied, all the stuff that they put into practice all those years. They still know it. They're just not using it. David said, I don't just want to know it. I want to hide it in my heart that I might not sin against him. And he says, that's, I'm putting it on places of honor, his word. Why? Because that's what I'm going to be judged by. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every jot and every tittle of it. That's how much he cared about it. Brother Jordan, what are you saying? I'm saying that you can't agree with the world if you're trying to live for God. If you are in agreement with the world, right, the world's ideas, okay, the world's mentality, the world's direction, in order to be in agreement with that, you've got to be against God. Because you know what the world's message is? Do whatever you want. You know what God's message is? Do what you know is right. Follow the Lord. Do the will of God. Be used of God. Why? Because God bought you. You know it's right that if you're bought, you're able to be used however the person that bought you wants to use you. Well, says, for ye are the temples of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God. They will be my people. Well, if he is your God, he will walk in your heart. He'll walk in your life. He'll have free reign to go around and do as he wishes in your life. There's no restriction. You haven't put up any red tape and said, Lord, don't go this way. You can have everything except... What's past that red line, Lord? 
My sister Gloria used to sing that song. I let him in my secret place. What's that? That's the day when you get all the red tape and the yellow tape and you know, everything else, and you just cut it out the way, and you say, Lord, here's everything. All that I am is what you can have. That's called full surrender. And until you surrender and submit, God can't use you. Well, he can use you, but he won't. God can use whatever he wants to. But he waits for us to submit. It says in verse number 16, For ye are the temple of the living God, and God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. He will. But see, whether he's doing what you would like him to, or if you're in agreement with him, that's two different stories. Once you're saved, you're sealed with the Holy Ghost. Can't undo that. He's going to dwell in you. And if he dwells in you, I find that if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard, not a son. So if you're not in agreement with God, God's going to get you in agreement with him. Even if it takes turning over this fleshly body to destruction so that the soul might be saved. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying God will do whatever it takes to get you back into agreement with Him. Even if that means you've got to see Him face to face in glory. God will dwell in you. And He will walk in your life. But it's up to you whether y'all are walking together or walking opposed to one another. Well, Brother Jordan, who would be dumb enough to walk against or opposed to God? A whole bunch of people. A whole bunch of people that know better. A whole bunch of people that don't know better. A whole bunch of people that used to do right that now don't do right no more. A whole bunch of people that were never taught to do right and they've done wrong their whole life. Who would walk contrary to God? Anybody that doesn't believe in God and also reverence God. Because in order to come to God, you must believe that He is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. If you don't believe in God, you're not going to fear God. But if you don't fear God, it's because you believe you can be right with God without having to diligently seek God. Right? Because in order to come to Him, you've got to believe that He is and be a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. You think you can be rewarded by doing whatever you want. I find there's only one way to have reward of God, to diligently seek Him and do what He says. That's it. God's not impressed with what you can do. God's impressed with using you to tell somebody else about Christ. God's impressed when you've got enough common sense to say, Lord, I'm nothing, but you're everything. Just use me as you will. But you can't do that. If you've got fellowship in your life with infidels, with idols of Belial, with everything in your life that's bringing conflict into it, rather than harmony. Being unequally yoked together is about discord. Disharmony. The opposite of unity, which is division. But see, because you yoke together, you can't get away from it. You've attached it to you. I've already said the ox can't let itself out of the yoke. So, Brother Jordan, what's the, the answer? Well, it's very easy. Verse number 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate. Now, I'm very simple. I believe that separate means not a part of. Okay, that just doesn't seem too complicated there. To say you got to go off in the middle of the woods and make yourself a compound where you get your own water that doesn't come from the city and you don't use the television, it uses the, the airwaves of the world and you've got your own radio channels. And it, I don't find any of that in that verse. If that's what God burdened you to do, good luck, I'm staying in civilization. Right? You can go Lewis and Clark at all you want to, but God didn't tell me to do it. Hope you find a sack of joy, otherwise you're probably going to die. What's it say? It says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Now see, back in the day, 
It may have meant move in your house. That I've seen in today's world. People get saved, they live on the wrong side of town. God may, if they've got a burden for it, move them to a different side of town. Why? Because it's hard to be separate when you're right in the middle of everything. But see, separate is not about location. Be ye separate is about choices, and it's about what's in your heart. Truly yoking up together is the joining of two hearts. We heard about during camp meeting, right? Jonathan and David. Were they queers? No. But were their hearts knit together? Yes. They were best friends. Right? They had yoked themselves together. You know what the problem was? For Jonathan, he had two yokes on him and he couldn't decide which one he wanted to follow. He was caught between two opinions. And as he was caught there, he eventually died there. But, come out from among them. What does that mean? You're surrounded. In order to be amongst something, you've got to be in the middle of it. I don't find that a Christian's life should be marked with, on all sides, being surrounded by the world, associated with the world. But now, if the Lord takes you into the middle of it, you're going to come out looking the exact same way on the other side. He'll protect you. But it's talking about your choice. It's talking about your heart. If your heart's in the world, guess where your eyes are going to be fixated? On the world. But Brother Jordan, how can you say that? Because Jesus said, wherever, heart, or wherever man's heart is, there will his treasure be also. You can't even understand your own heart, but I know that the Lord does, so when... Jesus said, wherever your heart is, that's where your eyes are going to be, that's where your treasure is going to be, that's where all your hopes and your aspirations are going to be. I believe him. Because he knew the heart of man before he made Adam and Eve. But yet he still made them. Knowing that he'd have to die for them. So I think Jesus knows your heart better than you know it. And because he knows it, he's trying to get you to what? Remove your heart from among them and to separate it. Separate it under what? Under Christ. Separate it under God's people. Separate it under your homes. Right? That's why it says, and be ye separate. I don't think you got to go live on the backside of a mountain in a compound where eventually everybody goes crazy and then some federal government's going to show up. Why'd they go crazy? Because they're out there in the middle of nowhere and God didn't tell them to go there. They lost all their peace trying to do what? They thought they was going to go do something where they was going to be right with God. They may have had noble intentions, but there's just one problem. God wasn't in it. But, it says, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. But, hallelujah, y'all got your own homes. Your home, you don't have to share it with 19 other families from the block. Right? When you open the door, that's your space. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? There's a place for you to separate yourself. We can come out from among the world and separate ourselves here. Why? To worship freely. We've heard about some of our missionaries where now that ain't the case anymore. But yet, what do they do? I'm trying to do it in secret, not openly. But why do they desire for it so much? Because they got to be separate from the world. They can't worship and still be associated with everything that the world is. The purpose of separation is not so that you can look down on your nose at other people. The purpose of separation is so that you can avoid certain things. Separation is just saying, God put this line in my life and I'm not going to cross it. God said to walk that way and to not go that way, so I'm going to keep walking that way. But I'm not saying that I won't step across it, but when I do, God's going to correct me. I need to repent, get it made right, and then get back on the right side of the line. Separation is done in the heart long before it's done outwardly. And separation's purpose is because of the 
latter part of that verse. You separate to avoid from touching the unclean thing. Like Achan. Well, he took the wedge of gold, Babylonian garments of silver, he buried it in his tent. He thought nobody else knew, but he had touched the thing that God said not to touch. What makes it unclean? God said, don't touch it. Well, Brother Jordan, I don't have a problem with this. I can do this and still be right with God. Good luck with that, but if God said don't touch it, don't touch it. If you're trying to justify why you can touch it and still be right with God, as our pastor told me as I grew up my entire life, if you got to ask if it's okay to do, you already know the answer. You're looking for somebody to give you permission to do something that you know is not right. You're hoping that you can hoodwink the other person. Well, hey, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it. You already know there's something wrong with it. That's why you came and did the sneaky way that you went to go ask a question anyway. Well, I'm sure, I hate that stupid Miranda Lambert song where she says, you know, she does this, that, all these other things, but Jesus understands a heart like mine. He understands it doesn't mean that he likes it. If you live like the world and heathen, he don't like what's going on in your heart. Well, you say, Brother Joe, he said don't touch the unclean thing. So what's the separation do? Keeps you away from the unclean thing. For Brother Jordan, some people just don't have control over themselves. You don't have control over yourself. God could turn off your sanity and then you'd be out eating grass like a mule in the field. Right? You're one step away from being crazy and all them woke liberals everywhere in Hollywood. Outside the grace of God. Well, those people just don't have self-control. I find that the people that have the greatest self-control are the ones that understand enough. Right? I may be able to stand here and not touch that cup. I can leave it there after I get done teaching. But if I take the cup with me everywhere that I go, chances are... I'm going to touch it a whole lot sooner than if I leave it up here on the, on the shelf or on the pulpit, wherever it is. If you separate yourself, there's less of a chance of accidentally doing it. But we know there's no accidents. You either choose to do it or you don't. We do find that if you do it unknowingly and God reveals it unto you, that you're supposed to separate from it so you purposely don't do it again. Well, he's saying, Brother George, separation is not about what the Pharisees do, beating on their chest and saying, well, we're better than everybody else because we do X, Y, and Z. Well, good for you, but X, Y, and Z don't make you any more close or any more right with God than what God's standard is. Be holy. If X, Y, and Z don't make you holy, why are you doing it? And you're not like the other end of the spectrum that says once saved, always saved, doesn't matter how you live. Hogwash. If Jesus didn't care about the way that you lived, why do you think that when he came, he fulfilled all the law in the flesh? Because that's what God accepted. That was the standard. That's what he had to be in order to redeem you. Well, what does God desire you to be? Exactly like his son. If it wasn't important for you to live a Christian life afterwards, why would Christ have had to live a Christian life down here? Logic falls apart when you just start asking them simple questions but people that separate don't do it to beat on their chest they do it because they know I got a problem with that and I'm sticking clear far away from it if I told you hey there's a uh, bomb buried in your backyard don't you think that you'd steer clear of your backyard for a while till the bomb was removed but if I said hey if you go out that door you're going to fall in a pit you say, is that real? And I show you pictures of the pit. I show you other people that have walked out that door and fallen down into the pit. And you say, well, I think I can jump the pit. And you open the door, guess what? You fall in the pit. That ain't God's fault. That's your fault. Right? Along that way, God's going to say, hey, he's going to have red flags all the way down there. Holy Ghost's going to be trying to pull you away from it. Why would you open that door and you fall in that pit? Because you didn't separate yourself from it. Come out from among them. What's that mean? Separate. He says, and be separate. You know what that means? Not a part of. 
What's he saying? Get away from it. Don't be a part of it. Why? Because if you touch the unclean thing, God's not going to be walking freely in your life. He's going to have to chase you to get that made right so that you can once again separate yourself unto him. But Brother Jordan, what do I need to do to separate? Whatever the Holy Ghost tells you to do. Whatever this book tells you to do. Not what you think, what God thinks. Why? Because of the benefits in verse number 18. And I will be a father unto you. There's a difference between him walking and dwelling in you and him being the father that you spiritually need. He's going to walk and he's going to dwell, but you don't get the relationship unless what? unless you've separated yourself under his standard. And ye should be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. That's a promise from God. If you separate yourself from the unclean things of life, if you don't unequally yoke yourself together with unbelievers, you know who you're going to be yoked up with? The Lord. And if you're yoked up with him, he'll be a father unto you. Not because of you, but because of the son that you're yoked up with. You'll be his son, his daughter. Say it's not, Brother Jordan, say it's the Lord Almighty. Know why so many people that used to sit here aren't there anymore? Because they lost fellowship. Why? Because they stopped being separated. And instead of avoiding the unclean thing, they went and they grabbed it with both fists. They swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. And what did it do? It defiled them, and it got them away from the things of God. Don't look down your nose on those people. You're one bad day away from having the same thing happen to you. That's the thing about the Joker. Y'all know Batman, comic book, this guy. Joker always thought that the difference between him and Batman was one bad day. Because he had the worst day ever, turned him into the Joker. That wasn't true. That man proved him that. But outside of the Lord, and left to yourself, you're one bad day away from being something that nobody else even recognizes anymore. Not because you messed up that bad, but because the only thing that makes you separate and special and different from the world is Christ. And if you walk away from Him, there's no telling what you're going to fall into. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.